I can't live up to the introduction. I'm just going to tell you that right now. <laughs> it's good to see you all. <laughs> Thank you for coming. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about um, child traumatic grief today. Um, sort of understanding the difference between typical normal healthy bereavement and grieving and child traumatic grief and how we treat it. So um, everything I'm going to tell you I got from all of these sources. So if anything I say is wrong, you can blame them. Okay, the TFCBT developers and their um, web course on child traumatic grief, which by the way if you're interested in getting more detail, you can take a free online course. It's about 10 hours. You can come and go from it as you please. If you've done, if you have done the TFCBT online course, which is basically the same address, tfcbt.musc.edu, and learn more about those. Okay. So, bereavement versus child traumatic grief. What is the difference? And then, and then grief focused treatment. So, we're um, we're not going to talk about trauma treatment because that's sort of a separate lecture. So this is, you know, what do you do when you're working with kids who have child traumatic grief? You've worked through the trauma and done that processing. What is the grief work that then comes after that? Okay. So what's bereavement? You all probably know this, but um, symptoms that occur following the loss, they tends to mimic major depression, right? Sadness, withdrawal, change in um, sleep or appetite, those are considered very normal um, following a loss. How long it lasts really varies. There's not a specific time frame. And it's recognized by others and by the individual as, again, being normal, a normal part of, of loss and bereavement. It typically recovers on its own. If, some, if symptoms last for an extended period of time, then you know, at some point you can consider a major depression diagnosis, but it usually um, resolves on its own. So for kids, common grief reactions. This is a table, and I don't need to read through all of it, but, you know, for young kids, um, becoming, um, having more separation anxiety, not wanting to, to be away from caregivers, um, some regressive behavior among kids, an increase in tantrums or withdrawal, all those things are considered normal. Following, following a loss. With school-age kids, um, same kind of depression symptoms, right? Um, or they could have no reaction at all, which is also considered normal. And so sometimes families will ask, like, why aren't they crying? Why don't they seem more upset? Or kids will say, I had a girl say to me a couple weeks ago, that she felt bad that she didn't feel more sad when her grandfather died. I said, that's not necessarily abnormal, right? So kids are going to have all kinds of reactions, and even having a minimal reaction is okay. Um, in teens, again, any, any of the same kinds of things, they might be, um, teens might be more reluctant to share feelings of sadness or guilt or shame if they have those following a loss, but they can also evidence those same kinds of symptoms or no symptoms at all, okay? So these are, these are common, and these are typical uh, grief reactions. So complicated bereavement, um, this was going to lead us to child traumatic grief, okay? Complicated bereavement means that there has been a loss, but there are also other complicating issues. So there are other things sort of in there that complicate these feelings of loss. So it's more than just this feeling of loss. It's I have all these other feelings related to these other issues, okay? And those issues prevent the child from participating in the grieving process. It's like these other issues, whatever they might be, are kind of getting in the way of allowing the child to go through that, that normal bereavement. Things like a stigma around the loss or around the person. So having a parent who overdosed, for example, on drugs, there might be a lot of shame associated with that, or anger that comes up for the kid. Criminal activity, I treated a boy whose dad um, was killed um, during a drug exchange, um, and he had a lot of shame around that, about how his dad died, right? A loved one dying of AIDS or some other, some other way that has a negative stigma attached to it, okay? Trauma kind of falls in this category. So if there's a traumatic event associated with the death, then the child can develop PTSD symptoms, and those symptoms interfere with the grieving process. 
which is why we call it child traumatic grief. So it's the loss of a loved one in a traumatic way, and the, tr the trauma of what the child experienced is getting in the way of, of their grief. Yes. Certainly. Could be lots of things. Yes. Absolutely. A suicide of a loved one. Absolutely. Yes. So this complicated bereavement, you know, just puts people at risk for later pathology or continuing pathology. And so obviously the sooner we can intervene, the better the outcomes. I just wanted to touch briefly on this. There is a proposed diagnosis in the DSM-5 for persistent complex bereavement disorder. So it's not in there yet, but it's being discussed. Basically, talks about bereavement symptoms that persist beyond six months in kids and 12 months in adults, and includes reactive distress to the death or some type of social or identity disruption. And one of their specifiers is traumatic bereavement. So this may be coming down the pike. Yeah, well, yes, certainly being in a situation that continues to be traumatic and where they're continued to be exposed, certainly that's going to interfere with grief. Or it could just be the matter in which the person died. And things may or may not be, you know, like it could be a child in a normal healthy home, but because of, because of the death itself and the way that happened, that can interfere with their grieving. So, so yeah, I'll, it can be any of those. Yeah. Is there another hand? Okay. So what is trying grief, it's, there's a traumatic death um, of a significant person. The child experiences um, the death as unexpected, frightening, gory, or shocking. Keep in mind that kids view things differently than adults, right? They have a very different perspective. So things that might not seem gory or frightening to us might be to a child. So think about a loved one being in the hospital, receiving, um, you know, intense medical care, tubes, and all kinds of things, um, you know, hooked up to, can't talk. You know, if a child sees a loved one, a grandparent, for example, in that state, and that's a very foreign state to them, that can be very frightening, right, in a way that might not be to adults. So just keep in mind it's really about, about the child's perception, okay, of that death. So here are the traumatic grief reactions, okay? So in contrast to what we consider normal grief reactions, Traumatic grief reactions. For really young kids, a lot of repetitive play around the death, kind of over and over, this persistent play related to how the person died. They're having a hard time getting back on track. So in typical grief, there might be some regression for a period, but then it resolves. In traumatic grief, um, it does not resolve, and there continues to be difficulty meeting developmental milestones, getting back on track, difficulty being soothed. Um, with school-age kids, they might talk about it a lot right, um, focusing on it, and then the PTSD symptoms that you might see, nightmares, hypervigilance, um, anxiety, difficulty concentrating, excessive worry, so worrying about what's going to happen to other people now, now that I've had this loss, is, are other people going to die, am I going to die, what hap what's going to happen to me, what's going to happen to other people, okay, and same with adolescents, you might see an increase in risky behavior, suicidal thoughts, the sense of foreshortened future again, what's going to happen, okay? So, so what this does, the PTSD symptoms interfere with their ability to go through the, the bereavement process, okay? Because, and again, this table sort of goes through a lot of specifics that I won't read to you, but, but essentially, um, when, the, when the child thinks of the person that died, what do they think of? Anyone guess? Do they think of the happy memories? Right. They're going to think about the death, right? If it was a traumatic death, if somebody died in a scary, horrifying way that was traumatic, remember, we're talking about trauma, like something where this is, this is a really horrific thing, and this person died, and the child might have felt they were in danger, or they certainly saw somebody die, or whatever the situation was. They're going to think about the trauma when they think about that person, if they've got child traumatic grief, right? It's that PTSD, right? So that it's the intrusive thoughts, the memories, the images, all of that is coming to their head. So they're unable to move past that into, 
let me remember the happy times and let me sort of reconfigure this relationship and the meaning behind that person's life and what they meant to me. They can't do those sort of healthy meaning-making activities because all they think about is the trauma. And so when our kids have experienced trauma, do they like to think about it or talk about it? No, <laughs> right? They want to avoid it because it's painful. And so they don't get this chance to process. So they, they think of this person, they, this image comes into their head of what happened about the trauma. They avoid it. They don't want to talk about it. So their symptoms persist and they can't move through the grieving process. Okay. So what we do in terms of treatment with these kids is um, we do trauma intervention like we would with, with anyone else, right? Using the same components you would use to treat trauma. So psychoeducation, um, helping them process what happened, processing thoughts and feelings, you know, um, being able to um, think about what happened and talk about what happened without feeling overwhelmed, right? All those kind of typical things we would do. Maybe some adaptations related to the grief, but essentially you're going to do the trauma work first. And then once there's been a desensitization and the child is able to think about the person without being so hyper aroused and they're able to talk about what happened, then we can move into the grief focused work and help them uh, move through their bereavement. Again, no specific time frame for this necessarily. It all kind of depends on the child and the family. And we'll talk about that as well. Okay, questions about that so far? Right. So what we've done with some of those cases allow them to do letters. Mm -hmm. we've kind of kind of like a variation on the narrative narrative thing uh -huh. and talk about what would they say to that person. People yes. Read, talking talking any kind of trauma case while they're in detention. That's the best time to do it. Yeah. Kind of help them through it. Sure. Instead of leaving it to their own device. Absolutely. Kids. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you shouldn't wait. Yeah. Right? Why would we wait to give treatment to kids? Yeah. We're gonna talk about letters, actually. Yeah. Good. Okay, so so we so assume we've been through trauma work, now we're going to do some grief work. And we're going to start with education, right? Educating kids and families about grief and death. So we're going to talk about it, just like with trauma, right? We're going to bring this up directly. Um, we're not going to wait for the child to bring it up. We're going to model that this is okay to talk about. And so we're going to be quite frank about it. And it can be helpful to talk to caregivers first. Like what have they told the child? What is the child's understanding of death so that you are being respectful of, of the family and their beliefs um, around death? We want to encourage families to speak about death directly. Like let's not use euphemisms or these other sort of terms. And I've listed many of them up here, right? Let's say what it is. Um, why would it be confusing for a child if you just said, you know, Uncle so-and-so went to sleep and didn't wake up? Right? Everybody sleeps. Yes. Everybody sleeps. So does that mean I'm going to go to sleep and not wake up or you're going to go to sleep and not wake up? That's very confusing. Right? Yes. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or they went on a trip. I heard a family say that one time. Well, he just went on a long trip. He's not coming back from his trip. Well, you know, that's not true. It's misleading kids. So we don't want to be dishonest with kids, right? We want to be very clear with them and concrete developmentally about um, what's happening. So, you know, usually this is done. People use these terms and, and try these phrases in an effort to protect the child, right? So, so, so their intent is good. And so validate that for parents if they're using those terms. Validate that. I understand you want to protect your child, but, but really it's going to be more helpful if we're just direct about, about um, how we want to explain it. Um, it also can be helpful to, so talk to, the, talk to the caregiver about the child's understanding, but then also ask the child, like, what, what is your understanding about what happened? What do you, what, what's your understanding of death? What does it mean when somebody dies? Right? See what they believe. Have them draw a picture of it. Um, or tell you, what, and then once you kind of know where they're at, that's going to guide, you know, what kind of information you give them. So it's also a good lesson not to assume that a child knows what death is or, or don't assume that they don't know, okay? Obviously, we want to keep it developmentally appropriate, and so helping parents um, 
give the child information at an appropriate developmental level. So here's a table um, around kids' understanding of depth and kind of what they typically um, in these ages. So obviously very young kids have no understanding um, of death and the finality of death. They think the person will come back. I was treating a three-year-old who lost her mother and um, the grandmother became the caretaker and and the child just did not understand and she just, the caregiver would just hold her for like hours and this child would sob and just say, I want mommy to come back. Why isn't she coming back? You know, and, and the grandma had to just repeatedly, repeatedly, she's not coming back, sweetheart. She just didn't understand. So helping caregivers understand that the child doesn't understand that, you just have to be patient, and be there and be available. Three to five year olds, they might have a primitive understanding that um, if something's motionless, it's dead, right? Like this table's dead. The rock is dead because it doesn't move, right? Um, they might believe death is a punishment or some, you know, something bad happens to you like the boogeyman or um, those kinds of things. Um, they, still might, they still might not understand the finality of death and believe that people can come back. Six to nine, they start to understand a little bit better. Um, they might think, you know, people die when they get old. Um, they might have magical thinking about that their own beliefs can cause death or could cause somebody to die. Um, that's not uncommon. Usually by 10 to 12, they have a pretty good understanding um, that it's not just old people that could die, right? That it could happen to anybody, usually adult and usually adolescents or they understand. So, so what is the grief, Ed? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you ask the family about their beliefs. What, what do you think happens so that what you're telling the child is congruent? Yeah. Yes, they do. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. We want to take whatever their beliefs are, make it as concrete as possible, and make sure that we're in step with the family and we're, that we're giving a consistent message to the child. Okay. Timeline for grief. What is the grief timeline? Are there stages of grief? Anyone? Yes. No. <laughs> so we used to think there were, right? We used to knew all of her, the Kubler-Ross stages of grief. Okay. But really, there's no like timeline. So letting. So this is a question that I often get. Like, what? So what should I expect? Like, what's it, when is it going to be over this? Or <laughs> when is? When will they move on? Or whatever. So there are, there are, they're not even really phases. We used to think it sort of went sequentially, you know, anger, denial, da 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 da, da and and now we now we know that it doesn't really go that way. People have, there, still can be those kind of there could be all those different feelings, but they're going to be they're going to be together, separate. They might repeat them. It does not go linearly. It's not sequential. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. It's rocked your world. Right. It's not predictable. It's not consistent. Everybody does it differently. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, some people could be linear, but not usually. Okay. Secondary adversities obviously are going to increase the risk of traumatic grief. So, um, you know, kids that remain in a domestic violence situation or uh, if they're in a natural disaster and they're still living, you know, in um, that setting where there are continue to be stressors that will exacerbate traumatic grief. Okay, the other thing we want to do is, is um, engender feelings of safety and work with caregivers on helping kids feel safe, psychologically safe, right? Um, we want to encourage caregivers to let kids know that they will do everything in their power to help them stay safe. We want to be careful not to promise them that nothing bad will ever happen again, right? That's very different. We don't want to promise anything that's not true or that we can't, we can't fulfill. But I can say, you know, as your caregiver, I'm going to do everything I can to help you be safe and to, to stay safe. So depending on the situation, if a child needs like a safety plan, if there was um, community violence, for example, in the neighborhood, somebody was shot and, and um, helping the child feel like they have a plan for if there's another shooting or if there's um, another episode or if, there's been domestic violence or whatever the situation may be. For foster kids, working with um, the foster parents on how to enhance psychological safety 
foster parents might feel like, well, my home is safe. Thing, I know things here are safe, so, they sh so the child should be safe because I know they're safe, and I've told the child they're safe, but helping them understand that the child doesn't necessarily know that, right, and they might not feel psychologically safe. Cultural and religious considerations, of course. Um, being familiar with terminology, so again, talking to the family, what's their understanding, what, what are the terms they prefer to use. Um, so we can use those, again, we want to be consistent. Um, understanding the differences in cultures, and so, you know, every culture, um, many cultures have different beliefs about, um, not only about death, but about what the survivors should do and how they should mourn the death. And so being aware of that and being respectful of that. So in many Native American communities, um, you're forbidden to, to speak the person's name, the deceased, and to talk about them. And so um, that gets tricky when you're doing therapy. And so enlist, you know, local experts or cultural leaders to figure out how can we help the child kind of work through this while also respecting the cultural norms. Okay, so understanding the differences, and of course, not, not assuming that everyone within a cultural group is the same as well, right? So, so it all goes back to the importance of talking to the family about what their beliefs are and how they want this handled and how can you respect those beliefs. Reactions, different communities might um, have different kind of mores around how you respond to the, to the death. So um, certain cultures, for example, um, don't want you to be overly upset or, or in, in public be overly upset about the person's death because that causes problems. Or um, in Mexico, I believe it is, they don't want you to, be, to appear too sad about the person because then their soul can't rest while you're upset. That makes sense? So just understanding some of those. And understanding um, deaths that might be stigmatizing because those are often like the ones that we might get. So somebody mentioned suicide, right, the stigma of, of a suicide in, in, in communities can be um, real negative. And so, again, utilizing local leaders in the community to help, um, to help the family make sense of it and to help work through how can, how can you incorporate those beliefs into therapy. All right, clinical challenges with, with education. You know, the child, you know, says they don't need um, this information. I already know everything. I've already talked about this stuff. And I will say, great, tell me what you know. You can teach me. Teach me what you know. Um, about this process. Kids that want to be with a person who died, this comes up quite a bit. And parents worry then, like, does, so is the child wanting to die? Like, is this like a suicidal statement? Those kinds of things. And oftentimes it's not. It's really just an expression of the child missing that person, right, and wanting to be with them. And so um, obviously you're going to want to assess that. We always want to assess for suicidality, but a lot of times that's what that statement means. Like, I just I want to be with this person. I miss this person. And so helping the child put words to that and to communicate that with the parent. Caregivers might not want to talk, right? Maybe they don't want to talk about, about the person that died because it's a loss for them too. So working with a caregiver around um, what the avoidance is about, what's their concern. They feel like they need to be strong for the child. That's often one. They don't want to be upset or mourn because um, they don't want to upset others. They feel like they have to be strong. Um, same thing about, oh, the clinician has difficulty talking about death. So this is a nice chance for us as therapists to reflect on our own kinds of issues around death or if this is a trigger for us and kind of knowing that about yourself and knowing what your own responses are and are you avoidant about talking about death and loss. Um, same thing, you know, when you work with trauma. We talk about this all the time, like sort of knowing what your triggers are and what your responses are so that um, you can manage those effectively. The caregiver showing little emotion, um, again, some of this might be to protect the child. Some of it just might be their own sort of response style. But I always recommend meeting individually with caregivers around their own responses and their reactions so that you know how to help them best help the child. Okay. Um, all kinds of things can come up with caregivers, too, around um, their needs following the loss. So if their partner, if they lose their partner, you know, do they... Um, have a need to find another partner right away and sort of exploring what that is and what that means for the child because that can be confusing for kids or if, um, you know, if a child loses a sibling, does the parent want to have another baby right away? Some of those things, just exploring with the caregiver and being mindful about how that impacts the child and then working with the child to help them understand. Um, 
What if the family asks about the therapist's grief history? So I think this just comes up in therapy in general, right? They want to know, patients might want to know, well, have you experienced anything like this before? Has this happened to you? And keeping in mind that usually that question is just seeking validation and, and they want to know that you understand them, right? So helping to communicate that. And you as a therapist have to figure out what, if anything, you want to share, but keep in mind it's not about you. That question really is not about you. It's about them wanting to be heard and understood. So, of course, exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So, just and then being aware of any special circumstances surrounding the death, the suicide stigma we kind of talked about. Um, sometimes with teens, it can be helpful to understand how they perceive, if, if, like if they've lost a friend to suicide or a family member to suicide, what does that mean to them? Do they, um, does that person become idolized, which sometimes happens, right, and around a school and it's like this person suicides and gets and all this attention and then people think this is a horror, horroric or thing to do. You know, assess what their beliefs are around the suicide so you know if you need to um, kind of correct any distortions or um, work with them around those kinds of beliefs. So I mentioned caregiver sessions, meeting individually with a caregiver, um, if you can, of a child, if there is a trusted caregiver to make sh sure that you're understanding where they're coming from so they can help the child. A couple common myths to work with caregivers on talking about it makes it worse, right? That's a common one. Hopefully, if you've done, tra if you've done trauma work with this family, hopefully you've gotten through some of that because you've been able to talk about the trauma and, and helping them understand that quite the opposite is true. The more they can talk about it and process it, the better they'll feel. Again, we don't have set stages. And the belief that kids don't grieve, right? Simply not true. Hopefully they would know this, but not always. I was doing a trauma um, training in Guyana, um, in South America, British South America, and um, we were meeting with like the Minister of Education. He was like hosting us to do this school-based intervention. and. Um, so we were talking about, you know, their big issue was community violence, although I think it was one of those things where that was sort of just the tip of the iceberg, right? But, but that's what brought us down there, and um, so we were, like, at some function, and there were some children playing, and he was talking about how this three-year-old had lost her mother, and um, he said, but I don't know, you know, I think our kids are pretty resilient. I mean, look at her. She's playing. Like, I don't think this has really impacted her at all. And we were like, um, and my colleague who was with me, who was a little more bold than I was, and he was like, yeah, no, actually, that's not true. <laughs> For a three-year-old to, to lose a parent is like you or I lo losing a limb. Like, like, there's a significant connection there. And she's playing right now, but that doesn't mean that this, you know, losing a parent has not affected her. So, um, yes. Yes. That? Yes. We're going to get to that. Okay. I have a slide exactly on that thing. So you're right with me. Okay. So basic education. Then we're going to do um, processing feelings, right? And so what we're really sort of targeting here are um, those intense negative feelings or ambivalent feelings or about the person, about their relationship. Um, those kinds of things. So sort of starting with exploring what's missed. What do you miss about the person? What was special about that person, about your relationship with that person? And they can do that in a number of ways, right? Art projects are great. Pictures, um, collages, they can write, anything like that. So, so we want to start to bring this out because remember these are things that the child probably has not been thinking about because they've only been thinking about the trauma. So now that we've processed that, let's start talking about what are the positive special things about that person and start bringing up those memories. Um, if sadness happens while they're doing that, that's normal. So we're going to just validate that. So it makes you sad when we think about these things because you really miss your mom. And, that, and that's totally normal. But we also know that these were happy memories. And so we can kind of hold both of those feelings, okay? Looking toward the future, right? So what are some things that are going to happen that this person is not going to be able to be part of? And looking at all those different special types of events, things that are sort of routine, you know, birthdays, holidays, anniversaries happen every year, ongoing things like summer vacations, what's that going to be like without brother there? Um, those kinds of things. 
So being able to process those, what are those feeling, what, what are those experiences going to be going to be like? Let's talk about them now. Let's process them and sort of anticipate how we're going to handle those coming coming forward. Future events, you know. My graduation, you know, my mom always wanted me to graduate from high school. I worked with a 13-year-old whose mom's overdosed. She said she always wanted me to graduate. She's not going to be at my graduation. So we spent time talking about that and processing that. Um, you know, going to college, having a family, getting married. My dad can't walk me down the aisle. You know, those kinds of things. So we want to prepare kids for that and talk about those. Any ambivalent feelings, we want to try and resolve. Right? So um, it's not unusual for kids to have um, ambivalent feelings about, about the person they lost, um, especially if, it, if the loss was, you know, in, a, in um, a stigmatizing way. You know, it was related to drugs or it was related to suicide or, um, or a crime or even if it wasn't. But giving kids a chance to just work through those ambivalent feelings and, again, kind of normalizing that. So this is just kind of a list of, of, of potential ones. Um, this one is sort of interesting if it was a public death and um, there might be some kind of public reaction to that death if it's, you know, was in the news or something and then the child might have their own feelings that are different than what's being portrayed in the public and so being able to process that um, and, and allow the child to have their own private experience and to validate and normalize their feelings and understanding that it's a different from, from these other feelings. So, um, so there's lots of those things. Relationships where um, an abusive parent, for example, and if an abusive parent dies, the child can have a lot of mixed feelings about that. Their relationship was not healthy and this person was, you know, they, it was my parent, but they hurt me, but also now they're gone and I have all these mixed feelings about you know, what our relationship was like and how I feel now. Tricky one is um, the child was closer to the parent that died than the parent that's alive, or maybe they hold the parent who was alive responsible um, for, the, for the person that they've lost. So working through all of those, we want to talk about that, we want to bring that out, help the child resolve those feelings. Normalizing, I've mentioned. So strategies for helping resolve those feelings, having a conversation with the person who died. So that could be a mental, you know, exercise. It could be in your office. Like, let's say your mom's sitting on the couch. What would you say to her? You can role play it, um, you know, role play it with you. Um, you can do the best friend role play. So, um, you know, if this happened to your best friend, what would you say to her? Um, if the child has these kind of unhelpful thoughts about the death or feeling responsible for the death, those kinds of things. If your friend was saying that, what would you say to her in doing sort of in, as a way to kind of question thoughts that are maybe unhelpful or inaccurate? Writing a letter to the deceased, right? Writing a letter to whoever died and letting them know and you can, they can have several drafts and you can go through a ritual of getting rid of it if you want to or the child can keep it, whatever seems most helpful for them. Okay, so... Lots of validation, lots of normalization. So dealing with the negative aspects of a relationship. Um, you know, the, talking about the fact that even though this, you know, was not the most helpful relationship or the most healthy relationship, I'm sure, I'm sure your whoever, parent, sibling, whomever, um, would want the best for you, right? So things might not have been perfect and that person might not have made good choices um, in terms of your relationship, but, um, you know, I'm sure they would want what's best for you. And our, and our goal really is just to help the child come to some sort of sense of peace. Not that you can change what happened, certainly. Um, and not that you're going to try and make that things are okay or soften if there was a lot of negative, but just to help them kind of come to some understanding um, about that person. Again, cultural considerations, talking about the deceased, being respectful of that if that's a cultural issue. Some of the challenges with this, with, help, with kids resolving their ambivalent feelings, is they might be protective um, of other family members and um, talking about how they feel, they might worry that it's going to upset other people. And so talking through with them about that, about um, that this is okay to talk about and um, working with caregivers as well if there are some issues about parents not wanting to hear. 
it can be that caregivers and kids are in different places, right? Maybe the, the, you know, they're in different places in terms of their understanding of the death and they're dealing with the death. And so helping caregivers understand that, that they, the child you know, doesn't necessarily have to be where you are and vice versa. There was one case that um, I was consulting on and um, the, ch the, the family lost the father. And um, so, so mom, in an effort to memorialize dad, had like created t-shirts with dad's picture on it and it like had his name, you know, and, like in memoriam and it had, you know, the dates on it. And, um, and I don't remember why, but, it, but she had the kids like wear the t-shirts to school like every Friday. And it was like this way to kind of celebrate dad. And then mom had like this whole, um, all these pictures and stuff up on the fireplace of dad and had sort of created, you know, this kind of altar for him. And anyway, so the kids had to wear the t-shirts every Friday. And this child um, was not doing well and was having a really hard time. And so the therapist is working with him and, and figures out that the child is really upset about having to wear these shirts to school because he's wearing them to school and everybody else is talking to him about that. Oh, tell me about your shirt. Is that your dad? What happened to your dad? Oh, he died? How did he die? Blah, 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 <laughs> right? And this kid is getting triggered every time he has to wear this shirt to school. And mom's intention was good, right? She's trying to, this is helping her in her grief and keeping his memory alive and all these kinds of things. And it just didn't occur to her that, that this is going to impact him negatively. And so the therapist had to talk through why this might not be helpful for him right now, right? And again, validating caregiver, like, I understand, yeah, I, have, I understand your intention. Are there other ways we can help you work through what you need to do with your loss, which is, you know, just as big as his, but we're in different places and we need different things, okay? Um, caregiver who might idealize it, um, the child who died. This is sort of the stuff that movies are made out of, right? You hear this kind of theme when... The good, you know, he was the good one, the Johnny Cash kind of story, right? The good brother died. Um, and helping the child, you know, is that really true? And how much of that is a distortion on the child's part? And, and, if, and if there is some truth to that, helping the caregiver work on helping this child feel special and unique and loved. And, um, and then we kind of talked about uh, if a child refuses to consider the negative qualities of the person who died, again, not unusual for a child to idolize. Perhaps the, the one who died becomes, um, you know, sort of idolized. And so just working through how much of that is necessary to work with, like um, does the child need to be able to consider these things um, with the caregiver or, um, or is this something we have to sort of process? Is it creating problems in some ways where the child is maybe devaluing one parent because they've idolized the other one? But, Right, sure. So if there are cultural issues, you have to you have to consider those as well. Yeah, so that's what I mean. Like, and you sort of had to consider how much of that is really necessary to address. If, it, if it's if it's interfering with family functioning and with the child, then then you want to work through that. Okay, caregiver sessions again. We'll meet with them, help caregivers with any of their own unresolved issues. And we're not the we're not the caregivers therapist, right? But we. We want to help the caregiver so they can help the child. So we want the caregiver to be in a good place so that they can appropriately support the child. That's ultimately the goal. Okay, and then preserving positive memories, of course. Once we've worked through um, all the feelings and any ambivalent feelings and sort of those kinds of issues, now let's, now let's really focus on those positive memories and, and create a keepsake if you can or if the child wants to. It can be anything. You know, I usually let the child decide. You can give them ideas, but let them pick something that they want to do. Maybe it's a picture, maybe it's a scrapbook, maybe it's a box of things. One of my clients created like a notebook and she, she asked people in her family to write something positive about the deceased and she compiled all the different things people had written and she liked hearing like the stories um, from, you know, before she was born and that sort of thing and she kind of put together this little life book that included pictures and other people's memories as well. So. Um, anything like that, involve other people um, if possible and, um, you know, hold a memorial service if that seems appropriate, okay, if the child, especially if they didn't get to have one, um, 
you know, if they weren't able to participate in the funeral or, you know, because um, it was so soon after or they're in a, just a different place now, especially if they're doing better, sometimes they kind of want to have their own ceremony. And so giving them that opportunity. And again, including loved ones or whoever is their support system, letting the child really have a lot of control over, over what is done, like what the ceremony is or um, if people speak or whatever that might look like. Again, cultural considerations, right? Um, we want to be aware of. Um, so for things like in, in communities where, where you are not to say the person's name, again, kind of working with community leaders around what is acceptable, like so if we can't say the name, what can we do, or like picture's okay, you know, just making sure that we're respectful again of the culture um, in doing that. And then, and then certain groups might have their own kind of um, cultural or religious memorial services that, that we might want to consider for the family too. Clinical challenges around doing that, creating the keepsake, um, the child might still be sad. Again, that's okay. I mean, it's better for them to be sad as they're going through the grief process, right, than to be like terrified of the memory of the trauma. So this really is sort of progress. If they've gotten to a place where they're sad when they think about the person, that's okay. And again, we want to um, continue to normalize and validate that. Um, Sometimes there might not be memorabilia, right? If there was a house fire, for example, or something where you don't have a lot of stuff, in those cases, try to be creative about other things you can do, like writing or, you know, people telling stories or drawing pictures. Um, with multiple losses, um, that can also um, be tricky, but, I, you know, again, sort of let, let the child be the guide in terms of... Um, how they would want to do that. Do they want to create sort of one thing for every family member or whoever was included, or do they want to do it separately? I had treated some siblings who lost both parents, and the feelings about each parent were very different. <laughs> one parent was the good parent, and one parent was the bad parent, and so they had they wanted separate, you know, of everything. So we did. We tried. We still did. You know, memories. We resolving feelings and doing memories, and they had separate memories, things, but they did not want them to be together. So that's okay. Um, the child's resistant to talking about happy times, you know, sort of going back to, to why is that? Is this kind of avoidance because they're still getting triggered? And if so, maybe we need to do a little more work on the trauma memory. Okay, but kind of figuring out what the resistance is about. Maybe they feel guilty. Maybe there's still some real intense negative feelings that we need to process. Um, or some distortions. Usually a lot of those negative intense feelings like guilt and shame are related to some type of distorted thought about about what happened or why or their role in what happened. And so if that's the case, we want to go back and address those. The child has unrealistic positive memories. Um, again, I sort of will leave that alone unless it's interfering in some way. You know, if it's causing some sort of problem. If, if um, you know, the child's not listening to mom because they've idealized dad and sort of throws that in her face and it's causing problems in their relationship or something. But otherwise, if it's just has kind of become ideal, idealized, then we don't necessarily need to respond. Okay, with caregivers, again, we're just helping them emphasize the importance of the child being able to preserve those positive memories. Okay, redefining the relationship. So this is sort of, you know, this person has died, but they will continue to be part of your life, right? They, they, played, they played a role in your life, and they're in your memory, and so let's do some meaning-making around that and figure out, you know, kind of redefining how I interact with this person, you know, mentally and emotionally. And so, um, so that's one piece of it. Um, you know, sort of, sort of re remaking that, the meaning of that relationship to that person. But then also, how does this change your relationships with others who are here still? And how can we strengthen and redefine those relationships so that you're getting support? And that, so maybe some of the needs that were met through, this, through the person who died, how can those needs be met through the people that are in your life now? Okay, so recommitting to new relationships, helping kids see it's okay to form new relationships, they might be reluctant to do that, right? They're, they might withdraw and sort of be afraid to connect again, and they don't want to experience another loss. And so helping them work through that. Um, connecting with others, letting others in, personalizing and integrating those relationships into, into life moving forward. 
Again, cultural considerations and customs. You know, so some cultures, you know, there are certain issues around loss, like if a parent loses a partner, there might be certain rules or rituals about when they can date again, how long their period of mourning has to be, all those kinds of things. So again, we want to be respectful of those. Um, some of this we talked about, the child might feel guilty about letting a new, a new let somebody else in. You know, if mom starts dating again and, and the child likes mom's new partner, they might feel guilty about that, right? Like, like if I love this person, that means I don't love my dad as much or whatever. Okay, so working with them on those kinds of feelings and helping them understand that they can hold positive relationships with both of those people, right? That loving one does not mean you're not loving the other. Not wanting to get hurt again, we talked about. They might feel guilty for moving on. I feel like I should stay sad <laughs> forever and sort of talking about that you can still love the person and miss them. You don't have to feel sad forever. That person would want you to be happy, those kinds of things. Um, a child might ask a parent if they lose a sibling to, you know, they want a new sibling. So can you just go get me another one? And sort of working through that, helping parents understand where that's coming from, because that might be triggering to a parent um, for the child to do that. And redefining relationships with extended family. So if a child's, you know, if one of the child's parents dies, then what does that mean in terms of the relationship with that family? So I don't have this parent anymore. Do I still maintain these relationships with those grandparents and those, those extended family members? And sometimes that gets real tricky, um, especially if there's conflict between the two families. And so helping the caregivers negotiate that and navigate that and reminding them that this is in the best interest of the child to have sustained healthy relationships with extended family members. And so helping them kind of work through whatever differences they might have Um, again, with caregivers, we want them to encourage the child to form those new relationships. Um, if needed, if you're working with a parent who's lost a partner, talking about, you know, the tr that transition for them. Now suddenly, I am a single parent, and, you know, and I was responsible for this, and, and my partner was responsible for that, and now I have all of it. And I'm overwhelmed, and I just had a loss, and I'm trying to deal with my child's loss. You know, that's... Care, that can put caregivers in a, in a really difficult spot. Or now I'm now I'm a new caregiver, and now I'm a grandma. These are my grandkids, and now I'm the primary caregiver because they lost a parent. So helping caregivers with their new role and understanding all of what that means and supporting them, helping them get support as well, whether that's therapy or whether it's just community resources or you know other supports um, out there. So. Um, like with all treatment, we want to assess progress and sort of plan for termination. So when we've kind of worked through all these things, um, we want to, you know, we're, what we're really assessing, like how we know when, the, when a child's done, right? Are they able to talk about the person without getting overwhelmed? If they're not having those PTSD symptoms, if they're able to um, make some adjustments and they're less distressed, they're able to talk about that person, they're able to talk about, you know, those positive memories. Um, you can do um, how you do sort of conjoint sessions with with parents can really vary, but you you know, but you can do sort of a closing conjoint session with the caregiver where you, where you have like a mutual share of you know their experiences or memories of this person or sharing memorabilia, that kind of thing. Um, really, a, a big goal is to help the child move from feeling completely helpless which is how they feel following a trauma and a loss, to being more empowered. Like, like, how, like what have I learned from this experience, right? How, how has this changed me? How has this changed my perspective? Um, asking kids to give advice for, to other kids. What would you tell other kids who've gone through something like this? Because other kids have these kinds of losses too. What advice would you give to them? Um, what has helped you the most? Helping them channel their energy. Um, you know, um, this sometimes can really motivate people to become involved in the community in different, in different ways if they've had a loss related to a particular event or incident. Maybe they become more involved in um, reducing violence in their community or maybe they, you know, um, 
one kid did what? He, he got involved, I think, you know, he had a parent that was killed by a drunk driver, so he became involved in, like, MAD or something, like, sort of using that energy to kind of propel, and, if they, and, and that's something that helped him feel empowered, right? Like, I can give back based on my experience, and I want to do something positive from what has happened. Okay, we want to prepare families for the future. Let them know that um, they're going to feel sad. They're going to have feelings of grief. There might be resurgences around anniversaries or different times. And to know that and expect it, and that's normal. Um, let's talk about what you can do when those feelings come up, because they will. Okay, so have a plan. And then let them permit each other to have those feelings. And again, knowing that they might come up at different times, and that's okay. Right, but let's, you know, give each other permission to have these, and that's okay. Circle of life activity is um, sort of having, having the child draw a circle and of, kind of mapping throughout the year what are some events that are going to come up and special things and let's talk about how we can anticipate those and plan for those and what would make it easier and who can be there to support you and those kinds of things. So we're talking about it. And then like with everything, termination is really important to have a healthy goodbye, to give kids a healthy end to therapy. In, you know, including cultural considerations, rituals, et cetera, using, you know, whatever um, feels appropriate to the family. Um, so termination can be tricky um, with some of these kids who have dealt with a loss, right? Because now they're going to have another loss if you're ending therapy. And so being sensitive to that and kind of talking about that and, and what that's like and what those feelings bring up and how um, to manage that. There might be ongoing legal matters, so if this, you know, if there's criminal activity involved and there's ongoing sort of issues, that can complicate things as well. Um, if there are ongoing feelings of revenge, right, where, you know, a child or a caregiver, you know, is, is still sort of feeling like they need to resolve it somehow or get revenge. So talking about those feelings and working on those and, and figuring out, um, how, how they can manage those. With legal issues, of course, we, you know, we want to minimize the child's involvement to the extent possible, so talking to caregivers about that. So if there are court dates, if there's like parole hearings or things like that that are coming up. I had a parent who was, a grandparent who was really involved, a boy lost his dad. So she was like, every time this person comes up for parole, she still goes to all the hearings. And they talk about it a lot in the family. We had to talk about the fact that, like, let's keep him out of that. Like, I understand you're, you know, your motivation to advocate for what's happening legally, and, and you should do that, and if that, you know, that was really empowering to her. But he does not need to hear about all of that stuff, right? Keep that separate. Um, and then, of course, you know, just being aware if, the, if ongoing treatment is needed. So maybe you get through the traumatic grief, but there are other issues, or the caregiver has other issues, just being prepared to manage that or to refer that on if needed. Okay, that is it. Questions? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, what if there's no caregiver involvement? Then I would still work with the child. Um, to, you know, to the best that you could, um, you know, and if you find out, like from that setting, if they're going into a new setting, if there's any way you can involve whoever um, is going to be, have them, like if they're not going home and they're going into foster care or they're going somewhere else, I would try to work with them, but if there isn't anybody, there isn't anybody, right, and, and so I would still, you know, go through all these things with the child. But maybe try to talk about the environment. Uh-huh. Yes, who could be that support person? Absolutely, yeah. Find somebody. It doesn't have to be a parent. Absolutely. Like involving any natural support. Isn't that a line on there that applies about um, when a caregiver makes the child feel guilty about having to do something on or something? Oh, like that? uh huh. And um, I guess kind of along the lines of what she asked, when you have a, a caregiver who is not involved in the family, Um, 
you said earlier, you said you're the you're the child therapist, not the caregiver. Mm -hmm. So how if, if the caregiver is unwilling to get their own therapy or and, and it's having a negative impact on the child's progress, how do you address that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so I frame it as, you know, let's think about what is best for your child. So, you know, if you've offered that opinion, you think therapy might be helpful, and they're like, no, thanks, and say, okay, I understand that if you don't want to get your own therapy, but this is what he needs from his perspective. And so even if you feel this way, let's practice, like, how you can respond to him. So, for example, if the child, you know, asks questions and she comes back with something that's not so helpful or, you know, whatever, negative about the parent or who knows what it is but so I might like just practice with her like let's think about how you can respond to that because he's going to ask these things but what's going to be most helpful is for him to hear X you know does that make sense so so um oh yes yes we want to include caregivers to the extent possible even if they're different you know you're not their therapist, you're right we're still yes absolutely meet with the caregiver I and and it's a good idea to meet with the caregiver by themselves before you include them together with the child so that you can assess where that parent is. Because if they're not, you know, on board or they're pessimistic or they're not where the child is, then we want to really kind of prep them for how they're going to interact with the child, both in a, in a joint session together but at home, you know. So when stuff's coming on at home, here's how you can be most helpful for your child. Does that make sense? And, and most parents, you know, most parents want what's best for their kids. Like they really do want to do the right thing. Sometimes their own stuff gets in the way, and so I just try to I just try to highlight it, talk to them about it, coach them if I need to. I know. Right, right. It's the same when my parent has pathology, mm -hmm. and they say, mm -hmm. give you the child and say, fix my child. Yes. But they're, 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 they're not dealing with their own. Right. You're, you're still kind of reframing it and saying, this is the best for your child, and right. the child is going to be in your best interest. Yes, if they're defensive about their own need for treatment or whatever, that's my reframe. Like, let's think about what is going to be best for him. This is going to help him the most. And, and you're so important, right? And I try to do a lot of, like, you're so important in how he gets through this. I mean, that's the number one predictor, right? It's for PTSD, the number one predictor for kids, and how they, they get better is how their parents respond. So that's what I say to a parent, like, this is for your child. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So the question was, was what about if the ch there's some transference issues and the child sort of becomes attached to you as the therapist, and how do you manage that? So, I, so we tried the best we can to get, have a caregiver involved, right? And and so. What we really want to do is we want to enhance that bond between the child and their caregiver. So that is always our goal. And not that a child's not going to get attached to you and they, you know, especially if you've been helpful and they like coming to therapy, then there, there can be some issues of termination about, you know, not wanting to stop therapy. And so in those cases, I would do things like, like, um, like decrease the frequency slowly of therapy, like let's meet a little less often and see how you do, and you sort of gradually kind of get them off and then talking about you know, it's normal to have those feelings and to work through, but but our goal from the beginning is to really strengthen the bond between the child and the caregiver. And I let the parent know that, like, you know, like, you, like you're the coach. I'm going to, like, pass the torch to you because, because you have much more influence in your child's life than I do. Them coming to see me once every two weeks or 40 minutes, that's, you know, that's not the key. You are the key. The parent is the key. And so letting the parent know that they're the, the big change element. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.